So we open our Bibles this morning to Isaiah 9. We start with a devotion and prayer. Hopefully I, we will give some example of how to teach and how to look at these passages. But we're going to start and begin with devotions um, somewhat as one offered and other more pattern schools do. <coughs> We'll learn a lot more about this location of this passage in a bit. But this is a time of darkness, particularly for Israel, the ten tribes that split off from Judah and Benjamin when Solomon died in 930 B.C., so 200 years on, here we are. And the northern Israelites will endure an invasion by Assyria, and all but patriotic fervor will be lost. Judah has paid them to come. Judah is now under the thumb of Assyria. Worse than that, they're under the thumb of sin. And so we begin with 9-1. What is the hope? When, as it says in verse 22 of chapter 8, and they will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. But there will be no gloom for her who is in anguish. In the former time, or in earlier times, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. In other words, northern Israel, the places where the Assyrians had to come first as they came to the land, and last as they left. First the slap, but then the back of the hand. <laughs> Darkness to a particular part of the people. But in the latter or later time, he's made glorious the way it's seen. Some of you know it's, there is no, most, a bunch of y'all know there is no future tense really in Hebrew. You have to determine by context. So sometimes when it says it has been done, it's, all, it's speaking as if it is as sure as the past, but it's yet in the future, as is true of this text. He's made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen or will see a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them the light will or has shone. For you've multiplied the nations, you've increased the people, in other words. You've increased its joy, they rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Which is right Gideon, the, the hero of that story. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Peace. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, <coughs> Mighty God. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of the Lord. Darkness. So many kinds of darkness. The political darkness here is real. The emotional anguish is real because of the political darkness, because of the distress and the defeat. And when Matthew quotes Jesus' ministry as fulfilling this passage, because Jesus is serving in Galilee, northern Israel, the most separated of the tribes, bringing them the light. It is a particular place, it is a particular people, it's a particular land. Jesus brings light in all these kinds of darkness. In his time, the darkness of the Romans, the darkness of demonic possession, the darkness of oppression, not just the Romans against the Jews, but as Zacchaeus was, Jew on Jew oppression. Darkness. All kinds of darkness. In the land beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the nations. And the people who walked in darkness see a great light. Jesus shining light into 
the lives of one fisherman, prostitute, priest after another, light. What light? Well, the light that comes from defeating the right enemy. The great enemy that Jesus defeats is Satan's sin, death, and hell. And when he defeated sin, death, and hell in Zacchaeus, that led to righteousness, justice, change. Quite a difference. And so, a little bitty number of people, as in the day of Midian, verse 4, in Jesus' time, 12 Jewish disciples, minus one on the night, which Jesus is betrayed, plus as many as seven and a few others, just a small band. They watch when they drink and they lap like dogs, these disciples. Just a small band. And yet, enough for victory, for here we stand and sit, God's people. Peace is coming. Verse 5. Why? What is Jesus according to the scripture? He is the son of David. Verse 7. He is the king they need. His name's our wonderful counselor. And, you know, I'm grateful to see my friend Dr. Outlaw here. She left me one of the few dry offices in that end of the... <laughs> And she is a good counselor, but that's not exactly, it's the word actually for planning. Some of you have gift administration, you think you're on the dark side. Pretty good to have a planner. This word <coughs> continues throughout Isaiah, and the point is God's got it all under control, knowledgeable plan. Mighty God, which is the only time that I recall, maybe one other time, I think there may be two instances, but the only one I recall, which is where... Deity is ascribed to a human character, mighty God, everlasting Father, no term limits on this one. Um, the interesting thing about term limits, even if you're dying to have the same person longer, you can't have them. And there's a term limit on all good rulers, even Queen Elizabeth, she will die. It's rather long, but it is certain that there is a limit, not with this individual. Prince of Peace. <coughs> Um, eventually Christians and everyone else well these Christians will know violence is not the answer peace will come to those who seek it particularly those who seek it in Christ it's interesting that in the Old Testament the term new covenant is only used once as you know Everlasting covenant, covenant of peace used several times in the other prophet. This is this is the head of those covenants. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, no end, peace. And so, when we come together on a Monday after a very busy day, most of us yesterday, for lay people, pastors too, for those who have taught, as my friend Philip Jensen said, you know. I'm, Sunday night, you wouldn't listen to any criticism of your sermon. You feel too good, you're up. On Monday, you would not listen to any praise of your sermon because you are too far down. The energy level is low. And if you've been teaching, it's the same thing week by week, month by month, year by year, decade by decade, you give your life to this. And you wonder, has it made a difference? You particularly wonder on a Monday. And yet we are told this is the light of the world. That even if it's day by day, week by week, decade by decade, year by year, just little bits of light, it all adds up. And massive changes result. So you are creating a body of work. It bears testimony to the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He is the light that there is. That is the real world. And one of the things we are doing in this Advent season is helping people who live in the unreal world see the real world, the one the Creator has made, and the light He has given. <coughs> so, 
Let's pray together and ask God to help us. Father, we need your light of your word today. We ask that you would help us. Even when it seems just the tiniest light from a pen, a flickering light ahead, help us follow the light and know if we walk through the darkness, you will carry us through. Father, help us. Help the world to see the light the way Peter and Andrew, James and John did, the way Mary Magdalene did, the way Jesus' mother eventually did and his brothers, and like we have seen it. So help us, you who are everything, help us to see your word today and to walk with you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Now we have schedule, and we will... Um, keep to it to 10.45, and then take a break at 10.45. Um, the first topic is, is Isaiah's gospel vision. The idea is to get a sense of the whole of the book. Now, if you're going to preach Isaiah for Advent, if you're going to preach it for um, Holy Week services and that sort of thing, that's good. We'll give some examples of that. But it's best to teach particular parts with an audio And so I want to start with that and I believe you have a handout that's first page is Isaiah's Gospel Theology. Does anyone not have that? Mike's helping us. Okay. Good to see you. Now so this first first handout we use Isaiah's Gospel Theology, and I want you to see what's in it so we can access it as we go. Um, I did not take the time to repaginate everything. I apologize for that. Um, but I decided also just to leave things as they were so you can see their different uses. The handout was actually given in a lectureship that I did at. Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary a few years. That's the Adams lecture part of the top. And you see this 14-point font. I no longer use notes that are smaller than 14-point font. I can see them then. Also, I have, I have people, uh, if you've noted the demographics, the baby boomers continue to rule the numbers, and so they will need help too, seeing. And so you'll see the 14-point font that includes, by page 3, Isaiah's Gospel Theology and so forth. As you get toward the end, the last three pages include approximate dates of key historical events related to the book of Isaiah. So... These are laid out for you and lined out for you, and we'll be using these. So this gives an idea. I don't know how you want to tear the staple out or whatever. I didn't know the best way for you to use it. But um, we have these approximate dates to help us. Um, I think I got an nice email from Jaron. He's back there the other day and said, you know, where could I get a list of certain dates? Well, for the ones we're using today, here. Now, um, Isaiah and the study of Isaiah is an awfully well-worn path. And sometimes scholarship and preaching traditions wear a path until it's a rut. And the question then becomes, have we looked at some things with fresh eyes? So one of the things I wanted to do when I as I was studying Isaiah and doing other things at the same time, but eventually uh, finishing two-volume commentary on Isaiah. It was supposed to be out by today, but uh, the publishers delayed a little bit. I didn't want to just reshuffle the scholarly cards. I didn't mind reshuffling them if I thought they were right. The question then becomes, what are we seeing? Now, we're on the structure of the book and seeing it as a whole. And my job here is to give you enough specifics without being shallow, but shallow enough to not get lost in the deep weeds. 
We'll see how it goes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start simply. You know, you have 66 chapters according to the way we have in our English Bible. Sometimes it would be helpful for you to get a reader's Bible without chapters and verses and just read and mark yourself, which is somewhat what I did. But the old, the old standard is right that there are two big sections to Isaiah, 1 to 39 and 40 to 66. Um, you can divide these up in 1 to 12 often, then 13 to 39 and 40 to 55, and then 56 to 66. Now, then the critical orthodoxy became 1 to 39 is more or less with some additions about the 8th century B.C. when Isaiah lived. And 40 to 66 is about the 6th century B.C. when another person writing, often called 2nd Isaiah, or depending on if you do 56, 66, 3rd Isaiah, um, and this was standard. And as I studied the book, I found uh, one thing particularly astounding that uh, scholars who believe that Isaiah wrote the whole thing and scholars who believe there are several uh, agreed on one particular. And that is 40 to 66 is all about the 6th century B.C. when Cyrus roamed the earth and later on with a particular focus on return from exile. That was very interesting to me. So that what I find is, for instance, John Oswald, uh, our sister school Asbury, divide the book into two parts, 1 to 39, 40 to 66, standard way. And when he was doing the historical summary of the book, he did 8th century down to 701, skipped all the way to 539 B.C. when Cyrus makes his decree and return from exile begins. Didn't even include anything from 701 to 539. So the question then became from a whole lot of critical scholars that I've heard most of my life. Well, it, it is possible that predictive, predictive prophecy is possible and it is possible you'd have 27 consecutive chapters of predictive prophecy. That would seem to be out of the norm. And that's exactly right. It would be way out of the norm. So one of the things that some of us began to do, very few, but Gary Smith's commentary, if you others say, well, are there, are there earlier historical possibilities? And began to ask, really a question that hadn't been asked for a very long time, that is, is it possible that the book works with the now of Isaiah's time and in the future from his perspective? Both. Is he always anchored in the, in the time period and then looking forward? Now, oddly enough, uh, that kind of started my thinking and then I asked a very simple question. Is the traditional structure the best way to read the book? 139, 40 to 66. Because you have that great, wonderful passage. 39, it's, you know, it's a pretty depressing passage where um, Hezekiah, having been healed, now is full of pride. God says some of your kids will go to Babylon. And then, though Babylon isn't mentioned here or anything about exile, because it talks about comfort my people, we have this new bright passage, and it must be a different time frame. Mm -hmm. Now, when I read the book again, read this book. I, I, I reading the scriptures is a way of life. So I, that's one of our emphasis in our preaching is it's a way of life. Not preaching is is not just something you drop in and out of and do. It's not lightning that strikes you sometime. And, and, and teaching the Bible week by week or instructing small group leaders or so forth, same thing, it's a lifestyle. So I'm reading Isaiah, but how we've learned to read it is going to affect what we see. 
I don't just mean good interpretative practice. I mean if you're used to reading Isaiah five chapters at a time until it's over, that's how you do it. Or you read it one chapter at a time, that's how you do it. This does affect how you read. So one of the things I noticed was that the book several times ends in Zion. So, like chapter 4, 2 to 6, beautiful passage of Zion. You start the book with Israel too stupid to know anything. Not as smart as an ox or a donkey. And chapter 4, God's people safe in Zion. <coughs> oh, well, that's nice. And chapter 5 starts all over with another big batch of sin. Chapters 11 and 12 are some of the great story passages of the Messiah and of Zion. We're drinking uh, salvation. Out of, we're drinking water from the wells of salvation. Oh, that's exciting. Chapter 13. Boom, here we go again. Sinful kings, sinful nations, on and on we go. And yet we end in a long one. Chapter 25, 26, 27. Passages that Paul uses about the resurrection. And you end with Gentiles and Jews in Zion. Seems pretty good. 28. Here we go again. Ending in 35. Uh, Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall come. Marching to Zion. Great passage. Chapter 36. You're starting to get the idea, aren't you? Here we go again. Blasphemous Gentile. Just God and design, and here they are cursing God. Hezekiah, he's a queasy king, isn't he? Not mm -hmm. quite sure what to do. And this time you keep waiting. And what you find is the longest section because we don't get to rest in Zion to 56, 1 to 8. It's the longest section. And then in shorter sections, I think because Isaiah is old. But from sin to Zion, from sin to Zion, from sin to Zion, seven or eight times. That's the structure of the book. Now it struck me that, as I say in the first page, having done this structural work, it's my point, um, and finding out that there are at least five times Isaiah used the word uh, that the New Testament uses for gospel. So I start here with this definition of gospel. I keep fiddling with it. The Hebrew word means news. That's all it means. News. That's all that, frankly, that's all the Greek word means. News. We don't know if it's good or bad yet. Because one use of this word is when... The, you remember uh, Absalom's fighting his father David and news of the victory comes that's the word used. does David take it as good news he does not good that we won bad that we lost Absalom and Joab that great barometer of all things moral <laughs> says well would you wish you act like you wish all of us had died that's the news you would have got so, I have very bad news. You're dying in your sins. I have very bad news. You stay in your sins, by my account. God has, has promised eternal death. There is good news. It doesn't have to end this way. But really, the jury's out on, well, we're still finding out whether all the people who hear God's news will believe it. <clears throat> and make it, and then it becomes good news. But the news declares a narrative of history, a story, and resulting obligations. Some summaries are longer. It's interesting. Paul gives from Romans 1 8 to 15 13 a statement about the gospel. It's very interesting when I hear people sometimes preach the gospel, in, and I'm, I really wish we'd have a moratorium on the phrase gospel centric. However, we have it. Paul doesn't stop talking about the gospel. See, I see, preach, see people preach Romans 1, 16, 17 where gospel is not ashamed of the gospel. Well, that's great. 
And then we define gospel whatever we want to, not by, not by what's in this text. And go right on. Now, it'd be fine if it's a, a good definition, I suppose, that we explain to people. But really, Paul reels out what the gospel means clear on to 1513, where he then takes up another subject. All of that in there. So, others are shorter, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 8. They all have certain elements. Now Isaiah, who's often called the fifth gospel when they ought to be called the first gospel, he uses the word that we translate gospel five times. Chapter 40, 41, 52, 60, and 61. And the New Testament writers use it. In Isaiah, what do we have? God the Creator. Uh, there's more creation theology in Isaiah than in Genesis by a bunch. So we have the Creator, the Maker. He's taking creation from its original flawless state through its current sin marred, though still lovely. Um, we need to remember that yes, it's true that for the purposes of salvation, we are as lost as we could be without Christ. For the purposes of humanity, most of us are not as bad as even we could be. So what subject we're talking about? Creation has been marred by, by sin and continues to be. However, this does not change the fact that there is beauty that the Noah Covenant goes on. It's a pretty good day out there today. It's one of the reasons I live here rather than Chicago. <laughs> However, sometimes people act like everything on earth and everything that there is is just as lost as our soul is of one sin. That's all a zero sum game. See, this is, I want to tell you why you can't convince people that because it's not true. <laughs> so, the issue isn't whether I'm better or not, or whether the, the issue is whether there's a single flaw in my record, and there is. Through its current sin marred, though still lovely state, to its final glorious state. That we're going from creation to new creation. Certainly not original with me. Uh, I think I, I first read an author from the 19th century, but I don't know where that person got it. How do we get him there? That's where we're going as part of creation. We can't help but go. We are on God's earth. We are God's creation. We are riding this thing all the way to the end. <coughs> I've only been on a roller coaster once. And I vowed if I could get off of it, I would not get back on it. But I knew I could not get off until it stopped. Now you can't get off this one at all. By means of His personal. That is, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, all three who are reflected in Isaiah specifically, not by my imagination, but specifically. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Working with people personally. That is covenantally. There are no impersonal covenants. Um, there are no impersonal marriages. You can be more or less personal, but it's very personal. There are no impersonal friendships. You might know somebody, but once we go into friendship, we go into per parental, and we go into familial. Father, Son, Spirit is personal, comprehensive. It includes people, places, creatures, and things. <clears throat> Redemptive. From sin and decay. This is His work. He is working with us personally, comprehensively, redemptively. Now, here's the part that I think has, has helped me perhaps the most as I try to pastor people here and church and beyond. He shares this work with his servants. That becomes clear. He shares his work with the servants. Now, this is from Genesis 1 on. We are stewards of what God has made. And that, that calling has not changed. That vocation is not altered. It is made extremely special and unbelievably important in God's church, which is his universal family. 
so that when we do good work, we benefit our family. When we as ministers do bad work, we hurt the family. And personal, comprehensive redemption, God is taking the world from creation to new creation, and he's sharing this work with us. This is why when you, someone asks me, is the whole Bible about Jesus? I say no. There are lots of passages about Jesus. Tons of them. Uh, people who doubt the scriptures, it's Billy, try to, try to raise them to have it. Sometimes people who believe they are in the scriptures overstate the case. I can preach to Jesus, but more than that, in the scriptures, they are addressed to believers First, I don't have to make one word of the Hebrew or Greek scriptures or the Aramaic scriptures either, uh, Christian scripture, because it's sent to us. And so, um, I serve Jesus Christ. He is my Lord. These days, that's more primary to me than he has died on the cross for my sins. So, he's Lord. He's died for me. This is what it means. But a lot of the scriptures are trying to tell God's people how to order their lives and live for him so that they might share his work. So I think we need to get over one way or the other. Lots of ways to communicate this. We need to get over being so worried that someone will think their salvation rests on their works that we never point out their works. Isaiah will point out what it means to share this work, do this work, because we go from creator who sends his servant, and then after Isaiah 53, it's only the work of the servants, plural, God's people. No wonder Paul says, here's Christ's body. So we have this gospel shaped message it's the scriptural message and we end in Isaiah 65 and 6 with the entirety of creation renewed and God's people <coughs> chapter 66 18 to 21 or so Jack and Pettis a long time ago wrote a paper on all the different places God is sending his people to tell the word and the nice thing is uh, Paul goes to all those places. Do me a favor, get that door. Thanks. Um, I know it slams when we when we close, but and we'll be headed out in a minute. But I'm so easily distracted anymore. <laughs> so as I read the book of Isaiah, I could see this series of trips to Zion, sin to Zion, sin to Zion. Look what I found. <laughs> hey, way to go. He has gone out and compelled them to come in. <laughs> um, we couldn't have planned any better. You're headed to Zion in chapters 1 to 4. No Messiah text here. Interesting. Afterwards, we do. 5 to 12. From sin to Zion with the Messiah's work as a key. So, under Isaiah's gospel theology literary structural framework, on the first page of the handout, how are we moving? One, four, six, from a sin-charged city to a shade-protected home. Next, from a sin-ruined vineyard. <clears throat> Notice the city and country keeps coming back and four, from a sin-ruined vineyard to a home with wells of salvation. Next, from the bane of war to the gift of resurrection. War and death <coughs> predominate in chapters 13 to 23. And in chapter 25, picture of Zion, Zion, God gathers his people and he gives them a gift which kings often did, you know, release a few captives or give a few land grants or whatever. God gives a gift that is, a, is a very interesting. He's going to take death away. The gift is 
It says if you have a big debt and I'm forgiving the debt, uh, there won't be any more death. Paul cites that one. And so in chapter 26, Isaiah envisions God's people popping up out of the ground like flowers in the springtime. Up they come. Oh, and that's a beautiful one. And the Gentiles are included in chapter 27. You take a big breath. We're not there yet. Marching kings is a marching lane. Uh, the kings are on the march in chapter 28. Uh, what, what Israel and Judah are going to do about that is important, but by the end, you have the blind seeing the lame walking. And good news, there are no fools there either. No place for fools in, in Zion. Well, then from arrogant Gentile kings to humble Gentiles in Zion's temple. You start with the Rab Shaka. What a great name for a for an official. Telling Judah that, that Assyria will conquer them as they have everyone else, and by the end you have the eunuchs of God, the eunuchs from other lands promise something more precious than children, a home with God, and brothers and sisters, uncountable. And you would think we are home, but we are not all the way home because the darkness of persecution designed a glorious light. Then helplessness before the foes. The vindication in Zion. You have these cycles. You might you might describe them better, differently, whatever than I have. But you will see these cycles that flow throughout the book, and it's, it's actually a great literary achievement and a great way of writing. Since you never know when your life's end, he's always put a point on it. And there are those who say, well, you know. Uh, perhaps the Raptors and that sort of thing. Well, they had to have things to work with, and this is his method. It's also the Scriptures. This is how the Bible runs. So I would say Isaiah's Gospel Theology. Isaiah reflects the biblical narrative and its plot. Yahweh created the heavens, earth, humans, and other beings. The whole world is sin and marred his creation. Thus he has made redemptive covenants with Noah, chapter 54, verse 9, with Abram and Sarah, chapter 51, verses 1 and 2, with Israel throughout, and Judah, and David throughout. He has chosen Abram's descendants to be a kingdom of priests, to gather the nations to be priests for Yahweh. So based on Exodus 19, in chapter 19 of Isaiah, you have this extraordinary passage where Israel, Egypt, and Assyria are each one-third with God's people. And that would include, at that time, nations great and small, and every known ethnic group on earth. Or, in 66, 18-21, God's servants are out finding more servants around the world. He has redeemed them from slavery and given them his Torah freedom. And that's what the Ten Commandments are. As we preach them to ourselves and to, to folks who are our friends and have come in or thinking about becoming family members. Uh, I look forward to the day we quit reading Exodus 21 to 17 as if it were posted in the Garden of Eden. But rather, given to a redeemed people, it says, here's how free people live. Mm -hmm. This is the real world right here. Now I can show that to us where we, when we fail. I can show that to the world as to what it would be like to live in our family. But it would do a whole lot of good if we realized uh, none of these covenants create relationship. They reflect them. And they govern them. So God has already redeemed them and given them, taken them to this mountain. Now, at their best, the Israelites do God's work, but at their worst, they sin against God and others. Eventually, they split into two parts, Israel and Judah. <clears throat> Continued by sin by both means loss of land. And, as I learned to teach these days, I don't want to hear ever again the phrase, the exile. Here are a few of the exiles. Of the north, 
And we know this from the Bible and from Assyrian records. 732, that's the time of chapter 7, more or less, of Isaiah. Assyria conquers the northern kingdom, makes them a vassal state. 722 destroys Samaria. 720 rounds up some more captives because of rebellion and so forth. In 701, Assyria took captives from both Judah and Israel. 670, which is a date we'll talk about. And now for the Judean exiles from ba by the Babylonians, four of them at least. So, exile is both warning and conclusion. But the notion that any time in 40 to 66 or 1 to 39, the phrase exile occurs, it must be about the 6th century, is simply simplistic. It's, it, is, it is unacquainted. And when I started studying Isaiah, I really hadn't thought about it in these ways. So what will God do? He will give them a fresh start after exile. That's what the Bible teaches. That's what Leviticus and Deuteronomy teaches. So I say, here on page two, thus in absolute continuity with and fidelity to those covenants, he will make a subsequent everlasting covenant peace with his people for the purpose of spreading his salvation to the end of the earth. That's in 55, 56, 59. He will comfort and bring Israel and Judah back to the land. He will unite them under David's heir in an everlasting covenant through the servant's death and resurrection. He will make them spirit-empowered witnesses to Gentiles and bring his international people home to Zion. That's Isaiah's message. That's the Bible's message. Notice that he sees this really as an ongoing from creation to new creation through God's redemptive work shared with his people sort of way. There is no big but dichotomous break in the middle. We will do better, I think. I, I know it's important for me to throw out a few controversial statements. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very sorry. That, there were, that we ever decided, and the early church did it, it's not a biblical thing to do, to decide there are only two covenants, old and new, and to, and to divide them from one another, really, and then to associate Hebrew scriptures with one and Greek scriptures with the other. You get think about it. Old Testament, Old Covenant, New Testament, New Covenant. I often ask my students, in the, in the Gospels, when does the New Covenant begin? It's an event. Luke 22, I think, is the New Covenant in my blood. So is all that, where should we move that Old New Testament thing? Don't take a convenience and turn it into uh, biblical history. There's enough, there's enough, diversity and dichotomies without creating the wrong ones. And so for Isaiah, there has always been sin. There has always been promise and failure in all the people, including Israel and including the church. Israel was always including the nations at their best. Read Ruth. Um, at their worst, well, they were at their worst see our local churches and our local ministers. And God is, is relentlessly pursuing this creation and creation. And eventually when you, have, you get a grasp of this, your real question is going to be with God's timing. Why is he so slow? Why does God's kingdom rise in Daniel 2 like shelf rock slowly emerging from the bottom that will compromise a big statue till it brings it to the ground rather than a great big boulder or an earthquake like we had in Alaska the last couple of days. Just bring it on down. God is not slow as some count slowness. I've often been the psalm. He's not willing any should perish. 
And he's got a clock on that, and I don't like his clock sometimes. Unless it's in my advantage. So this is the gospel. Now, a couple more minutes. I'm, I want to get this in place and tell you where you can find it. So that's the structural framework. Does it fit the historical framework? That becomes one of the big questions of Isaiah's scholarship. And without a historical context, it's hard for you to carefully draw specific analogies between the text and, its, and what it was saying to people in the past and what it said now. Because when I, when I do an um, application, what I want to have is a, as full a sense as I can of what's being addressed in the text and how it would affect the people and then draw an analogy to the audience I have. And I don't know who you teach. So I, you'll have to, you, know, you learn a method, but I can't say, well, I know your deacons need this. So one of the, if you want to improve your application, one of the things you can actually do is know your congregation better and know, your, know the history better. Mm -hmm. That's why one of the many reasons it's worth doing. So Isaiah's life, which runs from roughly 765 to 679 or 680 B.C. And I, I, can't, I can't emphasize this enough unfolds in the era of Assyrian world dominance. Well, you underline that. The Assyrians were running the show. Everything on earth ran one way or the other in the wake of Assyria. Somewhat like post-World War II world uh, America and then the Soviet Union. One way or the other. If you're a smaller country like Judah, you had to take into account how you were going to be related to Assyria. And note the domination periods, the whole lifetime, pretty much, of Jeremiah, of, of Isaiah, 745 to 612, and it does go into the life of Jeremiah. A series pretty simple. They were the first great money-collecting empire. They demanded obedience, threatened judgment, sent ambassadors, and set up kings. What did they want? The money. No. What does every loan officer want who knows anything? The money. <laughs> Show me the money. And so Isaiah is really working against the grain because he's giving what seems to be stupid political advice. <laughs> However, as you study the history of Assyria, it's not a lot of fun, but it's more fun in some ways <laughs> to study the history of Assyria. Recently published two books, a biography of Sennacherib. There he is, <laughs> <laughs> and his predecessor, Sargon. So, you know, frankly, for a lot of the preaching and teaching you do, all you all you need is kind of a, a half baked study Bible, look like a genius in Old Testament stuff. But you know, this this they will never question your they will never question you again <laughs> they'll be up here if you want to look at them yeah. that's right um, Isaiah is asking you want Yahweh to be your king or the Assyrians to be your king you want God or somebody else now it's interesting in the book that the text mentions Babylon. The tendency in, in biblical scholarship, particularly critical scholarship, but also conservative scholarship for years has been, if the text mentions Babylon, it must be after 605 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar became king of Babylon. He is very important in the Bible. Dan knew, knew that very well. But the problem is, Babylon was a living, breathing na uh, nation and city during Isaiah's lifetime. They were the constant opponent of Assyria. So, Babylon's a real country before Babylon conquered Jerusalem in 587 BC. And was a constant opponent of Assyria during Isaiah's lifetime. Therefore, they were always trying to recruit small nations like Judah to fight Assyria. 
And these small countries were always having to decide if they're going to become an ally against the great king. I don't know how Luxembourg and some other countries of that size survive, but it's not out of the, they're, they're not arming themselves to defeat all nations militarily. That's about the size of Judah. Now, you need to know and watch these texts that in the ancient in ancient times or in Isaiah's lifetime, Assyria conquered Babylon several times. And I listen there and they actually, I think, appear in order in the scriptures. It was always interesting. Chapter 46 and 47, a lot of scholars write, that sounds like the destruction of Babylon by Assyria in 689 B.C., but it can't be that. It has to be... Well, you know, if it quacks like a duck, you might want to <laughs> think it through. Because it was a peaceful defeat in 539 when Persia conquered Babylon, and it was a violent, violent defeat. So... Babylon opposes Assyria and gives hope to the other little nations. So does Egypt. Assyria conquered Babylon several times. And if you really want to be confused, sometimes the king of Babylon was also the king of Assyria. So, I didn't know some of those things when I started this study. I didn't teach some of these things before I knew them. There were also invasions of Palestine, and I list a whole bunch of them with the accompanying scripture text. So, this is stuff that's in the commentary. So, invasions of Palestine, conquest of Babylon, and then major kings died. Tiglath Pileser is king of Assyria, so is Sennacherib. And there are also deaths of Judean kings in here, given us time periods, which. If you look at your, I mean, the approximate dates segment, I link all those together in a chronological way. So, I'll conclude and we'll break with just this. The structure of the book in its movements design. Reveal to us the Bible's gospel-shaped theme and order. And though I know I don't have enough time to try to teach it all, I've tried to give you how it shows that the historical elements fit. The historical elements fit the gospel-shaped theology that is shown by the structure of the book. We are moving from sin to Zion. That's a structural reality in the book, not just a thematic one I've chosen to lay on the book. So you have the structure, you have this theme, and as we look at historical events, we see those fit as well. Isaiah's living a long life. He's a prophet for 65 years, from 745 to 680 B.C. It seems to me like he was probably some sort of government scribe or official. He is informed on what is going on. Mm -hmm. And the king's palaces and all the government offices were adjacent to adjacent cheek and jowl with, with the uh, temple. So, more about Isaiah, but here's a guy, a husband and a father and a prophet whose wife is also a prophet, whose kids are part of the prophetic ministry. By the way, they found recently near some jug handles with seals on Hezekiah, also with the name Isaiah on them. And so he's a real guy, living real times. He's making sense out of it because of what God does. He's making his literature read like this, and he's reading it within history. And so those were the those were the key things: gospel-shaped theology that's shown by theme, structure, and history.